Thank you all um, for joining. And it's my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Val Curtis and Dr. Bob Anger from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where they are um, leading the Hygiene Center. We invited them to talk about their behavior center design, which they've used to develop interventions for hygiene, which might be a useful way to understand core motivations for other behaviors, including sexual behavior and uptake of prevention interventions. So I'll turn it over to Val and Bob, and we look forward to hearing about their behavior center design and how it's been used to develop other interventions. Thanks, Connie. Hi, everybody. This is Val Curtis. Um, I, as Connie said, I lead the Hygiene Center at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and though our original focus for a lot of our work has been on hygiene, actually, Connie, we're working on a lot of different behaviors now, uh, well beyond just the area of hygiene. Um, I'm a, I guess I call myself a behaviorologist, um, but that means I'm trained in, I don't know, public health, epidemiology, a bit of marketing, um, anthropology. Uh, basically, I'm interested in designing effective interventions to change behavior. And my colleague, Bob. I'm, yeah, hi, I'm Bob Andrew. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, I've been at the Hygiene Center for about 10 years and uh, learned lots and lots about the uh, science of behavior and been involved in many different kinds of behavior change intervention design programs. So I'm going to do the major part of the presentation, but uh, it's but I wish to make it completely clear that the major thinking behind this approach that we're using comes from Bob. So this is very much a joint um, presentation, and Bob will talk a bit more and take questions at the end, I think. Um, so when we were in Boston, I think we all agreed that behavior was a problem. Um, we know that there are, we have so many solutions to public health problems, but and we, and we know what to do. We know what works. We know that oral rehydration works. We know that food hygiene is important, that exclusive breastfeeding is important. We know that clean water is important, to sleep under a bed net. And, 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 and in, other, in other settings, we know that exercise and diet and safe sex and prep are important. But there's a general realization, not just in the HIV world, that um, we just aren't doing what we know. Um, only 30% of people who, who have a kid with diarrhea use oral rehydration. Uh, and exclusive breastfeeding, every mother knows they should be exclusively breastfeeding, but maybe less than 30% are actually doing it. So we agree that knowledge isn't the problem. Something else is the problem. So as academics and theoreticians, we've been struggling with the problem of trying to understand behavior, as, not as a product of knowledge, but as a product of something else. Um, and we're evolutionists. So we think you can understand behavior if you understand what evolution designed it to do. So we're evolutionary psychologists of heart. Um, the, our approach builds on the science of behavior from many sources, from particularly the latest neuroscience, which is telling us a lot of interesting things about how behavior works. Uh, but we're not just scientists and ac academics and theoreticians. We're practitioners as well. And uh, this, this whole interest in theory and, and, and the science of behavior comes from us deep desire to want to do better about changing behavior. So as practitioners, we've worked on hand washing, we've worked on food hygiene, we've worked on nutrition, uh, and we've actually done a lot of work with industry as well, industry who we tend to see as, a, as another tool for public health. So we've worked on product marketing in the areas of, of um, toilet cleaners, um, um, soap, um, and we've learned a terrific amount from the way that they do behavior change. Um, and they've learned a lot from us, and our behavior-centered design, for example, approach is now being used by Unilever, for example, in a lot of their market development approaches. So what's the behavior problem? Well, it's all very well to think that, you know, if you tell somebody that they should go down a different route because, of, because it will be good for them, that they will change their behavior. But I think we all know behavior isn't like that. Behavior is in channels. Behavior is on track. It's on fixed routes. We do the thing that we did yesterday. We do the thing that's easy. We do the thing that everyone expects us to do. We do the thing that is, that is part of our daily routine. And what we need to do is to do something really major and disruptive to get behavior out of those everyday channels. Mm -hmm. so we, need, we need to find levers. 
We need to find powerful levers that can push behavior out of its current channel. So how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to take you through how we think about behavior. Obviously, we're interested in, first of all, being very specific about those particular behaviors that are related to health. And so we target behavior, we don't target knowledge. We target actually what people do. Now, of course, what people do is determined by their brain. Um, it's <coughs> but we've tended in public health to just assume that one sort of brain is determining our behavior. The things that we know in our executive brain, in our, that our executive brain is our rational, logical, um, computer-like brain. But in fact, we have three brains in our heads that control our behavior. We have, a mo we have a motivated brain, and we have a reactive brain, as well as an executive brain. Um, motivation, part of our approach is to understand what those basic motivated drivers of behavior are. And many of these are actually subliminal. People are not aware, for example, that um, disgust drives much of the reason why they wash their hands, for example. And people won't admit, for example, that the reason they might buy a sports car is because uh, they want to have a high status, for example. There's many reasons why we aren't able to even describe our motives. But if you go back to how we evolved as reptiles, mammals, primates, and finally as humans, um, we have a set of rules in our heads. They're like the voices of our ancestors which tell us what to do. And they evolved because those of our ancestors that did things that were good for them and their offspring had no offspring and therefore passed on those traits. So for example, pretty much every mother in the world has a nurture motive. The, fire, the sound of a child crying, a mother will leap up and deal with the child work as hard as it can to stop a child crying, to make it smile, make it happy. Um, and then they feel rewarded by the smile of the child, and therefore they do it again. And so this nurture motive teaches mothers how to become good mothers. It's something that's innate in us. So these motive systems are all systems that teach us to do the things that are good for us. And by knowing that we have these motives in our head, we have a very strong predictive system for enabling us to work out what the basic needs are that humans are trying to achieve through that behavior, and, and the reward system that teaches them how to behave in that way. And I don't have time to describe all of the motives. Uh, just be aware that you know, when you say, see the word love, it means something rather technical. It doesn't mean the word love as you might think of it. So love means pair bonds, love, and, and the behaviors that make us want to pair bonds so that we can bring up children, for example. You probably understand what the word lust means, and that's obviously quite important in the, <laughs> in, in the HIV world. Um, so that's part of our brain system that drives what we do, and it's important to know that that's there. Uh, we also have a reactive brain, a habitual brain. Uh, so much of, our, much of what we do is just a simple, almost reflexive response to the environment. So take a chocolate cake, for example. My executive brain might say, I'm not going to eat that. It's bad for me. My motivated brain will be hungry and go, oh, that looks so delicious. I really, really, I'm getting hungrier and hungrier. I can't bear, can't bear it. I want to eat my chocolate cake. And my reactive brain, if someone puts the chocolate cake right in front of me, within reach of my hand, I might even eat it before I even realize I've done it. So these are three different levels of control of our behavior that are going on all the time. Um, and they are responses to the environment. They are responses to the social environment, to the biological environment, and to the physical environment. So the biological environment is cake in, in this example. The social environment is, well, as to be a socially acceptable person, I would like to not be seen to be greedy. So therefore, I will try not to eat the cake. Um, and the physical environment might be uh, something to do with the, 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 the oven in which the cake was baked, or the table on which you're, or a plate that, 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 you, that you are taking the cake from. So the environment determines what goes on in the brain. The brain determines behavior, and ultimately, behavior in the, in the, in the long run determines, determines health. Um, it's, there's one other really important concept that we use that's quite important to understand, um, the setting. Um, if behavior does not just happen in isolation, it happens in particular contexts, and there's social and physical contexts, um, 
and also in a temporal context. So the things I do, as we said before, the things I do today are a product of the things I did yesterday in a particular context, and they're a product of things I did before that. So for example, we're all sitting in a meeting, um, and there are particular rules about how you behave in a meeting. And if, for example, somebody stood up and, and, and sang a song, um, it would disrupt the setting for the meeting. And everyone else would say, shut up. Um, but, uh, you're, 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 you're upsetting the meeting. So there's a certain homeostasis about that keeps the, the behavior that we all exhibit in a meeting on those fixed rails. Very hard to do anything other than what the fixed rails tell us to, tell us to do. Um, so that's a really important concept that comes out of ecological psychology of the 1950s. And it's something we use a lot for input. And I'll show a bit how we use it. Uh, in some examples later. So obviously our job as uh, public health people is to do what's in that orange box, which is to come up with an intervention. You know, maybe a funder will say to us, we want to improve health, we want to reduce HIV incidence, for example, and here's a pot, here's a pot of money, uh, please, please can we have an intervention? Now, I mean, probably in your world, and the same as the world that I work in, uh, the tendency is to do this in a great hurry. Um, we just, and we dream up, we maybe cut and paste from a previous intervention. We don't have much time to learn and think um, what the best way to intervene is. But the point of our BCD process is to force one to design an intervention in a systematic way um, using a process. And that's the process I want to talk about now. Um, oh, by the way, I've just stuck in the bottom in the, the fact that this is actually a theory of change as well. For those of you who are used to theory of change um, uh, terminology, uh, this is our theory of change, this thing you see on the this PCD process you see on the screen. Now, if you want to improve health, you have to understand what's going on in the environment, in the brain, in the behavior, and how that's producing health. The first step is a fairly obvious one. It's, it's the assess step. You have to figure out everything we know already, both in that context and globally, about that particular behavior. You, you then move on to the build step. This is, this is A, followed by B. B is build. Build is the formative research you do to find out the things you don't know. Um, and that we then take into a creative process. And I think that's something that's quite different about our approach from most public health um, communication development processes. Um, we, we don't talk about messaging. We talk about changing behavior. In fact, we have a rule, for example, in, in, we have a rule, no death, no doctors, no disease, no diarrhea, no, uh, we have, we, the rule is you have to find another way to change behavior than talk about health. Because health isn't a motive, as you may have noticed in the list of, in the list of motives that I gave you. So we have to find other ways in. Um, working with creative agencies like uh, Low, like Saatchi's, like, um, actually, we have a lot of success working with, with excellent local creative agencies who are able to bring to life and make exciting and engaging the principles that we brief them with. Uh, and, and we use an industry process of briefing um, to, to, to make sure we get the best out of creative agencies. And then there's a testing phase. Um, now, then you obviously design your, that the creative team design the intervention. The intervention is delivered. Um, getting it delivered correctly is, of course, terribly important, and it's a step that we tend to gloss over rather too much. Um, it, 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 if we don't do it, if we don't deliver it with some fidelity, then we waste, we've wasted all this effort. And then clearly, we evaluate um, what happened in the program. So the evaluation um, will look at what's changed through the theory of change, um, and look at the, the outcome uh, in terms of behavior, and sometimes in terms of health. Um, so we, look, we do both process and um, an outcome evaluation. So step A is the assess step. Uh, fairly obvious, I suppose. We tend to use an industry-style process where we get we, all, we, we collect all the information there is, but bring it together in a framing workshop. This is an example of a framing workshop we did in collaboration with Unilever, which was collecting everything that we knew about sanitation demand. Um, and, and we turned we turned the corridors of the building we were working in into our brain, and all the materials were organized uh, using our theory of change uh, to figure out what what we knew already, what we didn't know, and what our hypotheses were for what might change behavior. Uh, then the B step is the formative research. Now, I think 
another difference with what we do and what's normally done is that we don't see formative research as being about talking because we don't think talking is what really determines behavior. We see it as trying to understand behavior. Um, so, we're, um, and we do it not using, well, we may use focus groups, but, it's, that, but, but it is not automatically that we, would, that we would use those focus groups. So behavior trials are really important to us. Trying to understand the daily routines and the settings in which people work are really important to us. Um, for example, um, video is something we use a lot because it can teach us a lot. Uh, about behavior rather. So, so this is a nutrition project in, in Indonesia. Um, we have data from what, from reported data on what mums said they were feeding their children. But had we not videoed them, we would not have realized that in fact that when it came to meal times, mums were always chasing the kids down the street trying to feed them. So we looked back in our videos and tried to work out what was going on. And what was actually going on was that the mothers were giving snacks to the children when they got hungry and that was just half an hour before a meal. And therefore, the kids weren't hungry. Um, so there was a, a, and if you compared that with, with the official data about nutrition in Indonesia, you didn't see all this snacking that was going on. But in fact, culture was a massive amount of snacking. So it turned out that that was a problem that we would have to deal with in the intervention to improve, to reduce stunting in Indonesia, which is 40% of Indonesians are stunted, shockingly enough. Um, here's another tool we use. So we take each motive and we run it through the behavior that we're interested in. So, for example, in, uh, in Zambia, we were interested in um, oral rehydration. And one of the motives that we tried on, on mothers was um, hoard. So we think that every human being has this desire not to waste things, to, to save things up, to keep them, like, like for a rainy day, like probably many of you save hotel soap. It's not very logical or rational. You end up throwing it away. But we all love hoarding and collecting things and find it hard to throw things away. So it turns out that mothers in Zambia, um, they, they don't like, they, they see making uh, oral rehydration as like a cooking recipe. And therefore, you can do it approximately. And you don't want to make a whole liter because the child won't eat it, won't drink it, and will have to be thrown away. So they, they, they use an approximate measure of half a liter, an approximate measure of half a bottle, and end up of half a sachet, and end up with a solution which is actually dangerous for the child rather than helping to, to, to rehydrate it. So that was so using motives that you might not have thought of, like hoard, gave us some real interesting insights into the behavior that was going on. Uh, we try to bring it to life as far as possible, make it as behavioral as far as possible. So this was a, a baby master chef event that we had with moms in Indonesia to look at their, look at the kids' reactions to different sorts of baby foods, for example. Um, in the and and that was that proved another very rich source of information. So those are the sorts of things that we try to do in the in the formative research. That allows us to have insights. I've given you some examples of some of the insights we found. Um, we bring that together with an analysis of the channels of, of, of communication um, to, the, uh, to the creative organization. They need to know what all the parameters of the intervention are, how much money we've got, what the population we're trying to reach are. And because they're commercially oriented, they're also very focused around the issue of penetration. So it's all very well for us as you know, public health people to sit in the room and say, oh, you know, it would be great to do, uh, to do a special event. Um, and, uh, but but, but what, the, what the creative agency has to do is to work out how much that event would actually impact on what proportion of the target population. Um, and so we have to put together a, a cost-effective campaign plan. Um, and I guess the other difference of the way we work to, well, to the way public health often works is that we don't just accept the first fancy thing that the creative agency come up with. We tend to get into a long process of pushing them back and making sure, because they will always come up, first of all, with a health education program. And we said, but we told you we don't want you to talk about germs. We told you we don't want you to talk about diarrhea, and they just don't get it. And it takes them quite a while to get back to the idea that there might be other ways of, for example, promoting hand washing that isn't about germs, for example. Um, so they have to, and, and the brief is absolutely key to this. So something we've learned from working with industry is having a very sharp and clear brief uh, that tells that the, that the agency have to work from. Then the agency uh, start work, come up with concepts. Uh, they originally, uh, for the program on hand washing in, in India, um, which I'm going to talk about a bit now, uh, they originally thought that the lady um, on, at the bottom right 
was, uh, was going to be perfect for the target audience, but I made them test various options, and in fact it turned out that the bottom left was the one that they all loved. And she became Super Amma, who is the, who's the emblem of uh, a hand washing campaign that we rolled out in India. She's kind of aspirational. She's a little bit higher level than the level of the people who were there, she wasn't, she's, uh, but she's attractive and not dumpy, and uh, in the end everyone fell in love with her quite strangely. So um, Super Amma, the challenge from the agent from the agency uh, was design an intervention to reduce diarrheal infection through hand washing um, with two days two two actors in on two days of activity so two it's two people in the field uh, for two days in a village um, so the formative research told us that one really strong way to get people to wash hands with soap was to, it was for mums to teach it to their children as good manners. Mums were teaching all sorts of things to kids with good manners, like washing their, like, like brushing their hair um, and going to school, tidy and clean and keeping their books clean. Uh, but hand washing with soap was not part of it. So we added it to, uh, to, to the list of things that mums had to teach their kids. Um, but we also found from the formative research, from many different pieces of formative research, that the idea that your hands are disgusting and contaminated was a very powerful way of getting people to remember to wash hands. Uh, and clearly, in India, all of our studies have shown that hand washing with soap was down at a rate of about two or three or four percent, and therefore the norm was absolutely not to wash hands. And so we had to find a way of implying that it was normal for everyone to wash hands. So we needed to change the environment. That's the green box through a TV commercial, through demos, and that's something I'll come back to. We use emo demos a lot, emo demos a lot, little demos that force people to talk about behavior in a way, in an emotional way, rather than in a logical, rational way. Um, and uh, so let me, uh, uh, let me take you through uh, the, t the, the TV commercial. Um, in fact, it was shown in, because this was a trial, uh, we didn't run it on TV, we showed it, as, uh, we showed it in village events. So this is Super Amma. She's, uh, she has a young kid, she's a busy lady, she goes out to collect uh, water from, and she gets her son to wash, her, wash his hands. She looks after him, she feeds him, uh, she combs his hair, she gets him ready for school. This is all part of the stories that we got from, the, from, the, from real life, from, from the formative research. She teaches the son how to be well-mannered to the local people um, she, and, and to respect them. She, in, she, she puts him to bed at night, uh, and you get a lovely, a, uh, you have to watch, by the way, you must go and watch this film afterwards, we put the link. Uh, by the point you see this, this point, you're getting a nice warm tingly feeling, all about nurture. Uh, in fact, I'm getting the tingly feeling, just, just, uh, just talking about it. Um, you see the mother uh, at night, uh, but then you cut to the son, who was in the, who was, it, who was in part of the story, who's now grown up, and of course, as every mum has told us she wants, her son's grown up to be a doctor in the city. He's got kids of his own. He's got a wife. He's remembering about, his, his, he's reminiscing about his mum. And it's almost as if his mother's died. But then suddenly, and he's, so he's reminiscing how she loved him, how she looked after him, how she, cut, how, she, how she held him and cuddled him. And then suddenly there's a ring at the door and Sing Super Amata appears. And She's, she's still alive, but you see what's happened. She's become small, and he's become big. Um, and there's this lovely moment of reconciliation where the whole audience watching it are, are in tears. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, I mean, probably some of you watching it, you'll be, you'll be hardened, uh, you know, hardened skeptics, and you won't, maybe you won't feel it. But it's, uh, it, what we tried to do was to build, you know, build hand washing into the effort of really important part of what mothers do to nurture. So that was one of the things we did in those villages. Uh, another thing we did, I said we, use, we like to use these emo demos. Um, this guy is called um, Lalu Lingam, Lalu Lingam, and he's disgusting and filthy and revolting. He's an actor, but uh, he's in, in, in a school, uh, and he's making sweets for the children, but he wipes his nose, and he rubs his bum, and he sniffs. And he doesn't wash his hands with soap, and of course the children go Ugh! when he offers them the sweets. Whereas Super Amma is making sweets, and she washes her hands, and she's lovely and clean. So you get this powerful disgust response from the kids. It's funny as well. Uh, and dealing with norms, one way we dealt, we dealt with it was to get mums to pledge to be hand washers. 
and their names actually went up on a board in the in in the village. So there was a and, and actually there were pictures all over the village as well of actual villagers washing their hands. Uh, the, the village leaders, for example. So that created a powerful sense that there were that that uh, that hand washing was normal in the village, whereas in fact it was very rare. Um, so that that was the super Emma. Um, what do I want to say about? Being yeah, it was summer of super Emma being delivered. Uh, but I'll I'll skip on to the Easter, which is the evaluation. Um, as I said, there's multiple ways in which it's important to evaluate. Uh, if you have the lu the luxury in a research setting to evaluate very carefully, uh, you can learn a terrific amount. Uh, the intervention was rolled out in seven villages and, in, and not in seven control villages. And you can see the results um, that 37% uh, of the second follow-up, six months after the intervention, were washing hands with soap. And even the third, even 12 months after, so six months, uh, so yeah, 12 months after the intervention, um, we still were up at 30% the, um, and the control villages joined at 30% when we rolled the intervention out in those. Villages. So that was published in Lancet Global Health. But what we've also been doing is looking at a process evaluation through the theory of change about what, what actually changed. Um, and you can see that in the intervention group, 84% thought that hand washing was good manners. So clearly we've, we've turned the dial on the manners. Uh, we turned the dial on nurture as well in the, because mothers, 63% of mothers in control villages in, in intervention villages compared to two in control thought hand washing protects children. Uh, they also thought that more in the intervention thought that hand washing led to success in life. Of course, it's a little and tiny bit implausible, but still we seem to have it, it seems to have gone in. Um, and the idea that it's a norm to wash hands with soap has gone up to 35%, which is pretty good, we think, for a, for an intervention which everybody was high, including ourselves, was highly skeptical that we could get hand washing up at all from its very very low base. So we were very encouraged by that intervention. Um, to give you a different example, talking about oral rehydration, which is one of just a little bit nearer to, to your problem with PrEP. Um, this is a program we're working on in Zambia. It's called Azimayu Bamu Komboni. Um, that means we're the, we're the mothers of the compound, the housewives of the compound. Um, the the and Yani means we're checking you out. And the and that sounds a bit a bit heavy, but actually this came from the formative research insight that all of the um, uh, diarrhea-related behaviors that we were interested in were actually taking place in public, and people were gossiping and chatting about what was going on. Um, so we had, we had um, uh, the approach, the, the theory of change in this approach is that if you remind mums that people are watching uh, and, that, and then commenting, and that they will notice that you're, when you do the right thing, if we can remind them what the right thing is, then they're going to be more likely to do it when they feel they're being watched. So we have a series of ads where you have these, uh, the, these ladies. It, it, you must again watch the ads because they are fabulously, brilliantly acted and actually love beautifully shot. And they were shot in a week by a director that we hired uh, at very short notice um, to make these ads. So they're, they're actually relatively cheap, but still quite powerful. So these are the Comboni housewives chatting about another member of their, of, of, of their group whose child has been seriously sick and they're worried about what's happened to the child. They're a bit concerned that the mum isn't particularly good at looking after the child and has not been doing the right thing. Um, so they say, okay, let's go and see him, please. And then there's this lovely uh, scene where you see the mum dancing with the child. The child's better. The child's happy and the, the, there's the sun pouring in the window. Uh, and they're all stunned by how wonderful the child is. And the mum tells how she's managed to save the child, um, and she, she talks you through the skill of preparing the oral rehydration. And uh, one of the other things that we realized is that there are 500 liter bottles, uh, 500 milliliter bottles that everybody has, and it is possible to use two of those and make, your, and, and, and make the oral rehydration correctly. And she also talks about the zinc that she gave the child. And as if by magic, the child is better. Everybody's happy. They all get together again. Uh, and, 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 the, and, and the mother is welcomed as part of the group, and they all dance, um, and uh, everybody gets a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. Um, yeah. Because, yeah. And, and a lovely song as well, which a local, a, a local star recorded for us, um, all about the Cambodian housewives. Um, but I think that one of the key things is that the mother is 
there's a kind of slang term. This one is a mixer, and it, it, this mother has been recognised as being a good mixer. So she is not got a badge as being a good member of the community as a mixer, and therefore she's accepted in the community. There's another ad, for example, on hand washing in this one, where where, where the Comboni think that the woman doesn't wash her hands with soap and therefore refuses to shake her hands. And then they realize that she has actually washed her hands with soap. And they say, oh, sorry, sorry. And they bring her together and know everyone is happy and loves each other again, etc. So you can join the Comboni Housewives Club. Uh, they're, they're kind, nice Combonis. Uh, they care about you. I thought I'd talk about settings. This is an example of how we use settings in Nepal. This is my PhD student um, was trying to do the incredibly difficult task of getting mums in Nepal to adopt five different food hygiene behaviors. Um, we thought, you know, the rules about public, about health communications are one behavior only. How on earth do you get five behaviors changed at once? So we realized that mums had this, uh, this kitchen area which um, you actually which, which was semi-sacred already, you weren't allowed to go into it when you're menstruating, for example. Uh, and the kitchen area was, um, every, every holy, it was repainted. So we said, okay, why don't we make it a safe food hygiene zone? And so we had um, like local parties, local kitchen makeover parties. So the, health, the local health agent worked with, with little groups of women locally to make over their kitchens. They, paint, they repainted them, decorated them, put a line around the edge saying this is the safe food hygiene zone, uh, and with reminders. Um, and uh, my, I mean, this is my PhD student is astonishing, but, any, but for various reasons. But these are the results he got. Um, with uh, so most of the individual behaviours changed from rates that were that were in the low tens up to the low up to the high sixties. And if you take how many mothers actually were able three months after the intervention to still be practicing all five food hygiene behaviours, he was at forty three percent, which. Um, we're going to measure it again in a while and see how long this is sustained for. Um, and, and again, it was a fairly intensive intervention, and the next step is to try and make this a, uh, an intervention that would be completely scalable, though he believes this is scalable to Nepal um, already. I think we, have, think we have a debate about this. How do you make these interventions uh, truly uh, replicable? Um, so what doesn't... So, I get, so just to go back to the theory of change, um, I think there's three things. I told, talked about a lot of ways of changing behaviors, but I think we can summarize it as three really vital things we have to do. Number one is surprise. Um, that means you know, behavior won't change if something doesn't change in the environment. It's got to be something new. It's got to be something surprising. It's got to be something that will intrigue people. And people aren't intrigued by something that doesn't move or doesn't change or isn't new, so you tell them the same old thing again and again, of course they're not going to change their behavior. They know already they should be, they should be breastfeeding exclusively. Telling them again is going to make zero difference to them, but giving them a demonstration which shows how disgusting it is to pour lots of nasty food into a child, which is one of the emo demos we do. We use a plastic bag where we put into it all the things that a, child, that a mother tends to give an, an under six child and shake it all up biscuits that have fallen on the floor, posho, um, uh, Coca-Cola, and pass it around the mothers and they'll go, ah, and they kind of, the lights come on, they realize that they've been feeding all the wrong things to their child, but it, all it needs is breast milk. These, sort of, these surprising things that actually force a health agent to do a demo with a mum rather than talk at her about her bad behavior and how she should learn to do, some, do something different. So that, and that's number one, something new and surprising. Number two is to revalue that behavior. And it's the same old marketing trick. I talked about the sports car. You know, a sports car gets you from A to B quite fast, but it's bright red and it's sexy looking. You add value to the sports car to sell it. And that's what we need to do with these behaviors. So for example, though hand washing is about, ultimately about, reduce improving health, you can actually make it a purification ritual that removes disgust. You can actually make it something that gives you status and makes you uh, recognized in the community. You're adding value to that behavior. The same thing we did with the oral rehydration. You can be recognized as somebody important in the community because you're a good mixer. 
Um, and then the, the final part is about performance. So if you, you, you actually can't change the settings such that the behavior can be performed, um, so for example, the oral rehydration example, if we hadn't figured out that there was a, what, there was a bottle that could be used that was the right size, um, it would have been impossible for us to get the performance of the behavior. Um, and ultimately then, does that, get, does that get you to your impact? We actually argue, and this is another conversation we could have, but one thing that we think is very important is that it's not an awful lot of point in measuring an impact on health if you don't measure an impact on behavior in the first place. I think that's something you guys are realizing as well. There's no point in measuring the impact of PrEP on health if, you, if people aren't actually taking it. So we should be measuring the impact on behavior first of all. And that is much cheaper and quicker to do. So an RCT on behavior is still quite difficult and complex, but nevertheless, it is much more doable than a health outcome RCT. So this is what doesn't work to change behavior. The same old stuff, messaging, messages, death, disease, and doctors, and words, words, words. This is all about doing. What people tell you that they do is not the point. It's what they actually do is the point. And getting into what they do and leveraging what they do is what is the point. What does work is, I think, we think a systematic approach, carefully decorticate what's that? I try to understand what's going on and then intervene in what's going on, focusing on behavior and not on knowledge using things like emodemos that force you to change behavior in a different way, surprisingly, that revalues behavior and it enables the performance of behavior. Um, Bob? Yeah. So obviously, we've never worked on HIV. And the first thing we want to say is that if, if we were to work on it, we, will, we would want to go through our process. So it's very difficult for us to you know, sit here in, in London and suggest uh, ways in which we're going to solve the problems that uh, PrEP is having. Um, so what we would do is use our process. Um, and that would, again, always focus, focus, focus on the behaviors that are identified as being the crucial ones, which itself can be quite, <laughs> quite a difficult uh, process. Uh, then through our sort of formative research, find the key levers, and then through the creative process, make sure that any insights that we've identified are brought to life in a way that the audience that we're interested in uh, changing the behavior of can find relevant and inspiring. Um, and obviously, we need to make sure that there is this chance for performance, chance for contact with the surprising information. We need to make sure that the channel through which we deliver our insights and our intervention materials are those which are going to have maximum impact. So people have to be ready and attentive to take the, the, uh, the um, messages in, which are implied in the, in the intervention in. Um, so again, just as a way of thinking a little bit about how our approach might work. Um, certainly two things that we think are, are quintessentially um, applicable to any behavior change problem are our motives, our set of motives, um, the, the set which are most obviously relevant, the ones which evolution um, has designed into us in order to solve the problem of reproduction, which is the, the problem with HIV um, uh, transmission during uh, sexual contact. Um, it's the most fundamental evolutionary motive there is, um, reproduction. And um, that's, it's, in humans, reproduction is solved in, in three ways. Um, you have to be, it's through, through pair bonding and the formation of a family. So that involves um, being attracted to someone, falling in love, and then engaging in uh, the appropriative act. Um, all of these things are separate problems, and um, the uh, young African women uh, have various ways of trying to satisfy these particular goals in their lives, which will require them to, to engage in behaviors in different settings. But the, the PrEP is actually, taking PrEP is actually a very different kind of behavior. Um, so uh, we would also be very involved in investigating where um, PrEP is, is being acquired, where it's being stored, and under the conditions under which uh, it's being taken. And that may all happen um, at home or may happen at school. And uh, by looking very closely at the kinds of environments in which uh, these girls are having to um, 
to interact with these pills, um, we would hopefully get the kinds of insights which I think some people have already identified, like the fact that they don't have particularly private places in their homes where they might be able to store PrEP, and that leads them to problems of being able to take it. Um, so we think that our, you know, we would find that both the things which are already known, and, and I, we, we are quite confident other kinds of insights by, mm -hmm. again, a very close focus on, on our behavior and behavior in settings. Um, yeah. No, um, yeah, um, obviously the, the target population tends to be quite poor and um, from evolutionary theory there are suggestions that uh, one of the best ways to get out of uh, poverty, if, especially if you're a woman, is to marry up uh, into a higher class. And this probably is a, is a problem which they're very aware and uh, the, the whole sugar daddy phenomenon can come from an awareness that it's families who, which, which is the reproductive unit in humans um, because of the dependency we have uh, as children on uh, our parents to um, become mature individuals, socially adept individuals. So um, we're getting raised within the context of families where, where families are trying to control this very precious resource of, of reproductive uh, ability, which comes through our, our doctors, uh, uh, most in most constrained fashion because there are very few eggs that, that girls have, whereas boys can spread their seed very widely. Uh, we don't have to worry so much about their reproductive opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, families tend to protect their, their young girls very carefully. Um, and girls have to find ways of getting around to family control if they want to satisfy some of their uh, more urgent uh, <laughs> sexual desires. And there's a tension there which probably has gone in towards the, the uh, uh, direction of the girls in some of these families where they actually are able to satisfy uh, some of their both sexual and economic needs by um, attracting rather um, well, uh, men with resources. So. Yeah, but it may not be it may not be simply a, a, a transaction. It's a trading up um, to trying looking for love, looking for mm -hmm. looking for the best partner, looking for the best pair bond that they can. So that's what hypergyny is about, trying to uh, a strategy to try and get yourself married off in the end in the best possible uh, anyway. to the best possible to the mate that can provide the best possible. Opportunities for your children, for example. Anyway, um, these are just suppositions. These are some thoughts that we're just we, we, we've been chewing over. But uh, like you said, I think the process is what we're in, is, is, is is key in in, in this. Um, this slide gives you the links to those um, to those ads we talked about, um, and please do look at them because you just don't get any sense of of what of, of how of how there is a real response, of your, 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 your own response to them will tell you something about how they work. Um, and I think we'd be delighted to answer questions. Thanks very much for your attention. This is Connie. Uh, thank you, Val and Bob. And I just want to remind people, because we had issues with audio on the first call, that we're asking you to type in your questions and then we'll say them because we had a lot of um, background noise last time, so please please do type in your questions. I guess I'll start, since I, I'm not muted, um, by asking a question rather than typing it. One of the issues that I think we're aware of, in, at least in many um, settings, and there's a lot in South Africa, is that there's a, for young women, it's the motivations for sex include um, receiving goods. So you talked about the sugar daddies. I think it happens even in um, with boyfriends of their same age that, or slightly older, where th there's this way of getting a foot up in the world. So it's not necessarily with the idea of marrying up, but even in the short-term horizon, mm -hmm. young women acquire status, they acquire cosmetics or cell phones, whatever. Um, so I guess I would wonder how, um, if you were to try try to understand how you would um, address those kind of motivations, PrEP would not 
change those motivations, but it might reduce the, the risk to women. So I guess I'd be interested in your thoughts about when transactional sex is common, how you would, um, how you would characterize it and, and develop an intervention. And then I guess the second part of that question is, with a new, in, new behavior, like these PrEP is not available currently, but if you were to try to design a, an intervention to support PrEP uptake and adherence, how would you go about sort of your formative work when it's not available? I guess you'd have to do it in a, I'm assuming you might have to do it in a demonstration project, yeah. understand it as you, as you go. Mm. Yeah. On, on the, um, the transactional sex, I think the first thing that we try and do is to figure out what needs the current behavior is serving and what needs the new behavior would serve um, using the motive, using the motive framework. Uh, and I think it's like clear that a lot of this transactional stuff is about attraction. It's about, uh, he'll buy me a new dress. Now, if he buys me a new dress and takes me out with to, to, to a bar where there are going to be some other interesting, rich people who maybe I could move up into a new class and marry up, um, there's, there's, uh, the, the makeup is for that. The, the, it's, it's about a strategy for moving yourself into a better world. Uh, and it's not just about the immediate transaction. I mean, the trans you know, having a phone helps move you into a better world, too. Um, but it's trying to move trying to get yourself out of the, the, the misery of the, of the life you lead by, by the very nature of your, your femaleness. So I think we would really be looking very closely at what's going on uh, in that, what people commonly call transactional sex, and I'm not sure that it's, that's really what it is. It's part of this marriage game. Um, but, uh, and then what does the drug do to that? How does that perturb the existing? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things is this performance question, and, and what you're constantly having to do is to increase the value of, of your target behavior as, a, as relative to all the other ones. And obviously, transactional sex has um, certain values for these girls. And what you want to do is, in some way, emphasize the value of alternative behaviors, yeah. um, like staying in school and, and you know, doing a bit of petite commerce. Uh, or, you know, giving them other avenues for achieving the same ends. And once we've figured out what those ends are, then, you know, we would, we would try to probably um, see whether the behaviors can be loaded with those values and, and you know, increased in, in salience for, for these women. Oh, and on your second point, we absolutely would have to be working with people who have some experience with PrEP. I mean, that would be, re re yeah. that would be sure. definitely required because we wouldn't be able to, to see how people are responding to it without that. Uh, for us, we would do, normally do behavior trials, but that you wouldn't do with a drug, so we would need to find people who were already used it, who had been exposed to using it. And you, can do different, you can do prototyping of different forms of delivery or different packaging or different, uh, I don't know. Maybe they need a camo, a camo pack that is, uh, that's, not, that, 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 that's, that's made yeah. to look like a pair of tights or, I don't know, or something that people would, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Or, or maybe it's, Maybe it becomes a maybe it becomes an attraction aid if we can find some way that it that it could actually work to solve some of those problems. But yeah, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the that's the problem. Yeah, it always takes us a while <laughs> to sort through the problems, which which are always difficult. And, and but with this framework, it allows you to to order your thinking and or, and have some clear hypotheses that you take to the field when you start, so that you know what you're looking for. Theory organizes, it t tells you where you are, and <laughs> where you're going, and it tells you what you've got there when you get there in the end. So we think there's nothing so practical as a good theory. Should we try to Thanks. get these questions? Um, the last part of the, that would be, is it possible to do formative work in a related behavior? Uh, for example, women who are using family planning methods to try to understand and extrapolate from um, women who are using the oral contraceptive pill to women who, yeah. what the motivations and behaviors might be to support mm. those behaviors for PrEP? Yeah, that would definitely be possible. Um, it's not perfect, obviously, but it would. No, certainly one thing we want to do is to read everything else. 
you know, the assess step would bring all that knowledge together first about what we know about those behaviors. It's a, you know, it's, it's related to a medicine adherence problem, and that's, you know, there are many, many, many studies about that. Great. Thanks so much. We have had a couple other questions. Um, the first one is a comment and a question from Haiti, and she says that she enjoyed the systematic thorough design. She especially liked the formative work and the use of video ethnography to capture data for the behavioral trials. The behaviors targeted, nutrition, handwashing, hydration, are all visible and accessible. How would you capture the more hidden behaviors inherent in HIV prevention? This is an excellent question. Um, actually, defecation is a, <laughs> is a pretty hidden behavior. And uh, what, we, what we do is, in that case is just film everything around it, uh, which actually is very informative because it tells you a lot of the contextual stuff. Um, the thing about def defecation, of course, is that uh, you know tends to happen every day, and quite often happens about the same time of day. So we usually can figure out when it's going to be happening, and we can film around that. Um, sex is a bit harder; um, <laughs> it has less routine. But as I keep pointing out, in fact, you know the oral prep problem is not so much about sex; it's about taking a pill. And that's a very different kind of problem, which you actually can use some of our standard techniques to investigate. Um, obviously, we don't want to. We want to understand, um, you know, the motivations underlying um, the pursuit of sex as well. But um, you know, those those kinds of things can be dealt with through diaries, and um, you know, there are bound to be creative ways that uh, that can be used to get as close as you can to actual behaviors. Uh, a technique we use a lot is scripting, so we get yeah. people to talk us through their daily routines, or it might be weekly routines. In this case, it would be more likely to be weekly routines. And then when you get to the part of interest, you then dig much more clearly into, so this happened, and then what happened next, and then what happened next. Of course, any morally loaded behavior, and many of the behaviors we deal with are morally loaded, you're going to get biased responses. But on the other hand, when you start from the wise position of having some theories about what's likely to be going on, it makes you much better investigator um, in, so that you can dig out what... Just a couple of weeks ago, Val and I were in, a, in um, Indonesia where we were hanging out with the teenagers um, where they do hook up. So, I mean, the other thing you do is you go to the places where these things at least get initiated yep. um, and, and find out what's going on there. You, so, you look at real behavior. Yeah. You get as close as you can, always, always. Not always perfect. But. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we have another question from Cindy Grossman, and she says, "Excellent presentation. You mentioned that you are awaiting data on the durability of behavior change. Do you have evidence that an approach that is more behavior centered has a longer effect? I'm wondering if tapping emotions has more staying power." Yeah, good question. Yeah, um, we think that there are probably a couple of different behavior change problems within that. Um, one is to get people to initiate new behaviors, and we think all this uh, motive stuff is very good at that. Um, although you can also just change settings sometimes. Um, you know, the the way in which you get people to stop driving so fast is is, is not to to tell them that um, they're doing the wrong thing. They already know that, but you put speed bumps in. Right? Um, you just change the environment that forces people to change their behavior. Um, but the, so there's a, there's a behavior initiation problem, and then there's a behavior uh, maintenance problem. And mo motivation can be important there too, but we think that most of the behaviors that public health people are interested in um, tend to be quite regularly engaged in, and the, the overall objective is to eventually form habits. Um, and we certainly have, in the world of hand washing, we know very well, people around the world who are washing their hands with soap are those who do it habitually. That's just, it's, that's just the way it is. People who don't wash their hands, they don't do it habitually. Those who do, do. So um, your goal is always to form a habit. Mm. Um, certainly with PrEP, you want to form a habit, too, because you want these girls to be taking this thing regularly. And um, I mean, we know, for example, in, in Nepal that moms have been told that they should do these hygiene behaviors, but uh, it has made very little impact on their behavior. But by changing their kitchen, by changing the social rules of how you behave in kitchen, you've made a, you've made a real impact. Now, how long will that last? Uh, 
we don't know. But as part of what we're working on is habit formation. And um, we see it as something a bit like conditioning, Pavlovian conditioning, really, um, where strong emotions and strong rewards lead to behaviors that, are, that get established over the long term. And uh, that's the trick. If we could all form habits, we would be doing very well. I think this is going to work way better than just lecturing people about, um, just messaging people. Is it going to be more, we don't know yet. I mean, like, no one anywhere in behavior change really knows how long you, how long behaviors are sustained, whatever approaches are used. This hasn't been, we haven't studied it enough. We do have good events in the uh, super amount. Super amount lasted an extra six, uh, so six months longer than we thought it would. <laughs> we should go back again in a year and find out. Great, thanks for that. Um, and so then we had a comment from Sarah Thorne who said, really interesting presentation and approach aligned with and perhaps could be enhanced with mental modeling. And so we are wondering what your thoughts would be about um, how the behavior center design could be augmented or combined with the mental models approach as well. Right. Yeah, we, um, we, we do think that there are, uh, you know, conscious, decision-making uh, slash planning aspects to, to most behaviors. Um, obviously, for oral prep, uh, you're not going to be able to take it unless you get it. Um, so, you know, and you don't have it now. So how are you going to get hold of it? That's, you know, that's uh, something you've got to figure out. And um, it's a question really whether knowledge is the missing piece or not. And I think there are particular public health problems where knowledge might be necessary. Right. And, and it might be important to change it. For much of the behavior we work on, knowledge isn't a problem. So, so that, that's why we're trying to work. That's why we completely dropped that whole approach, really, of, of sort of educating, messaging approach, and trying to get in in, in other directions. Um, but it may be that we do find it an aspect. I mean, it has been an aspect of nutrition program, for example. Is, you know, you can help motivate exclusive breastfeeding by pointing out, which nobody seems to know, that. Um, giving formula reduces your ability to um, breastfeed. Um, yeah, that's a good example, yeah. Um, so there are, you know, sort of belief-oriented or, or knowledge-oriented things which can be brought into a program, um, but we just don't think that's ever enough to get people out of the rails um, and onto a, onto a new pathway. Great. Well, I, I think your presentation was really interesting and we're really pleased. Um, I was wondering if you could perhaps send me the links to the videos, and then I could send them out to the greater group. They are in the presentation. Yeah, we will send the presentation. Yeah, we will. We will give you the presentation, and you can send the whole presentation out, and then the links are there. Great. Well, I want to thank you both for doing a really excellent job at synthesizing the approach and showing examples of your work, not just from hand hygiene, but also other relevant um, behaviors. And I think it, you did a remarkable job, given that you weren't able to show the actual videos. We will circulate your slides after you take out the photos to make it a smaller size. And yeah. with, we will, um, just for people on the call to know that, um, again, we encourage you to look at the actual videos and from Superama and from the other interventions that you talked about. And we hope that in the future, as we move forward with this process, that there will be ways to test your approach as we think about implementing HIV prevention interventions, such as PrEP for young African women. So thank you both for being part of this. And Thanks, Connie, for thank inviting you, us. Yeah. And everyone yeah. for being Thank you, and we will send out. Uh, we will also send out a link with a recording to the webinar. So, if people who are on the call want to forward it to colleagues, um, please do. So, thank you all. <laughs>